Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bowen here with you for another session of Microbiology Boot Camp. Our topic here is going to be Group A Beta Hemolytic Strep, also known as Strep Pyogenes. Now, if you're going through these videos in sequence, we've already talked about Staph, we've already talked about Alpha Hemolytic Strep, and now we are going to talk about the Beta Hemolytic Streptococci. And there are two groups of Beta Hemolytic Strep, conveniently named Group A and Group B. Group B will be the topic of our next talk. Uh, which is group B, which is strep A galactiae. Group A is strep pyogenes. So when you hear group A beta hemolytic strep, strep pyogenes should be what comes to mind because it's the only important one and you may hear group A beta hemolytic strep or strep pyogenes. They're really interchangeable, so you need to know both terms. All right. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking on the i button up here or uh, below in the description of the video. I've been making these videos now for almost eight years and they've always been free and they always will be free. Uh, my philosophy is that all medical review sources should be free. Because we need doctors, we need mid-levels, we need people in the healthcare field now more than ever with the pandemic going on. And there are a lot of resources out there that charge you an arm and a leg, and I just think that that's wrong. Even though, yes, it does take labor to go into this. This is a labor of love, and we should be training our successors for free. That's part of our Hippocratic Oath, is that we don't charge for medical education. Unfortunately, it's become a big racket. Um, but uh, I do appreciate voluntary donations to help offset the cost of these videos because they do take time and effort and time away from my family, time away from my job, and so forth. So uh, if you consider chipping in a little bit, it really helps. I really appreciate it. If you can't, I understand I was a medical student once upon a time and I was broke as hell, so uh, I get it. Um, but if not, you know, feel free to subscribe here on YouTube or patronize my advertisers. I uh, really appreciate it. So thank you very much in advance. All right, so this is uh, something that we talked about in a previous video, gram-positive, what makes a bacteria gram-positive versus gram-negative. I'm not going to go into it here, uh, but you should know all of this stuff for step one. It's all heavily testable, um, but I put it here just to reinforce the fact that Strep pyogenes, like all streptococci, are uh, gram-positive bacteria. And you should have an algorithm in front of you, uh, which I'm going to show you, so uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, this is gram staining. It's not the only stain that we do in microbiology by any means, but it's by far the most important one. And remember that gram staining, purple means gram-positive, reddish-pink is gram-negative. All right, so we are going to talk about the classification. I'll show you that algorithm I was talking about. Uh, you need to know how each bacteria is classified. And so every video I do, I'm going to talk about classification of organisms. And is this important for clinical practice? Absolutely not. But it is important for step one. Uh, if you're taking step one, you've got to know with every bacteria uh, its aspects of what makes it that particular bacteria. Uh, you can often get questions on step one that will give you a clinical vignette. You know the bacteria that's causing the disease, uh, but then they'll ask you, is this bacitrace insensitive or resistant? Is this PYR positive or negative? Does this grow in 6.5% sodium chloride or not? It's not clinically relevant, but it is tested. So, you know, I'm making these microbiology videos because in my infectious disease videos that I've made for the focusing on step two and step three, I don't talk about that. And I know that some of you out there are international students who maybe haven't taken step one yet. Um, so this is important stuff that you'll need to know for that. If you're a, a first or second year medical student here in the U.S., uh, you'll definitely need to know that uh, for your step one. So uh, we'll also talk about characteristics, lots of uh, virulence factors and toxins, probably more for strep pyogenes than any other bacteria that you'll talk about in microbiology. Uh, we'll talk about diseases and sequelae, primarily focusing on how those virulence factors play into that, uh, the symptoms, really how to diagnose it. We're not going to talk so much about the treatment and management. That's more step two and three stuff. 
you really want to know about that, go to my infectious disease talks. I talk about that ad nauseum. I'll give you this little story to help solidify this information. I am not uh, a creative person, as you probably are aware by now. Um, and I, <laughs> you know, I'm not too confident about these, uh, these illustrations that I've made, but I put it together for you because it really helps to have a visual way of remembering this stuff, particularly with strep pyogenes, because there's so much associated with it. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully it will help. I can't guarantee I'm going to make one for every single pathogen that we're going to talk about just because, you know, it takes me forever. And it's, it's really a challenge for me because I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm just not right brained at all. So, uh, hopefully you'll find it helpful. We'll get to that later. And then I put together a question for you, a step one style question. All right, this is the algorithm I was talking about. Now, I only put the details of gram-positive cocci because that's what we're talking about here. If I were to put all of this stuff, it would have taken up way too much space. Um, so the reason this is important is because you need to know how to work your way forwards and backwards. So you've got something under the microscope that stains purple. Your next step is to figure out the shape. If it's a rod, it's a bacillus. If it's a branching filament, then that's what it is. If it's a sphere, it's a cocci. So once you know it's a cocci, then you need to know is it catalase positive or negative. If it's catalase positive, it's staph. If it's catalase negative, it's strep. It's simple as that. Or you can just look at the structure. If it clumps up in clusters, it's staph. If it forms chains, it's strep. Once you know it's strep, then you wanna plate it on 5% sheep auger sheep blood auger rather and then you look at the hemolysis pattern if it turns green it's partial hemolysis it's alpha hemolytic strep if it completely hemolyzes and turns yellow it's beta hemolytic strep okay and we are talking here about beta hemolytic strep and there's two groups okay so let's say now you know it's beta hemolytic then your next step is to do a bacitracin sensitivity test and this is just like the novobiosin sensitivity test that we talked about with the oxidase negative staph it's just like the optogen sensitivity test that we talked about with alpha hemolytic strep um, so it, it just works the same way and um, You'll know what's resistant and what's sensitive based on whether the bacteria grows around the disc of antibiotic that you place uh, on the, the auger. If it grows around it, then you know it's resistant. If it doesn't, then you know it's sensitive, meaning that the antibiotic killed it. So bacitracin sensitivity test, the mnemonic you need to know is B brought. B for bacitracin. BR is group B is resistant to bacitracin, meaning that it, you'll have growth around the plate or around the the disc of bacitracin. Group A is sensitive, meaning that you will have a zone of clearing where the bacteria did not grow around the disc. Okay, so beta hemolysis, just to let you know, is uh, in fact complete hemolysis, and so um, so what you're dealing with with uh, with, with complete hemolysis is, is just lysed blood cells. And this yellow that you see is the auger underneath it. All right, so, um, so categorizing uh, beta hemolytic strep, you've got gram-positive cocci and chains, which is the definition of, uh, of streptococcus. It's catalase negative, which is also the definition of streptococcus. Uh, if you're talking about if you're talking about gram positive organisms, uh, gram positive cocci, uh, all strep are going to be catalase negative, and all staph are going to be catalase positive. It's complete hemolysis, which is what beta hemolysis is, and for our purposes, all strep are facultative anaerobes, meaning that it can grow in both oxi uh, oxygen rich and oxygen poor environments. And then we talked about the bacitrace and sensitivity test. So look here, you've got a plate and you've got, this is obviously sheep blood agar, and uh, you've got this zone of yellow clearing. So this is obviously beta hemolytic. And now this, let's say that this is a bacitrace and disc. Notice that you have this zone of clearing where the bacteria did not grow. So you know that it's bacitrace and sensitive. And remember that our mnemonic, B-R-A-S, B-Bras, 
B, group B is resistant, meaning you would have growth around the, the, the disc, and group A is sensitive, meaning you would not have growth around the disc. And so this is indeed strep pyogenes. Moving on to characteristics of S. pyogenes. So there are a lot of virulence factors and toxins here, and this is why this video is gonna last a while, you know, in addition to the fact that this causes a lot of different diseases. Uh, but I want you to know, if you're gonna be taking step one, you could be given a, you will be given a clinical vignette that gives you a patient and all their symptoms, and you know what the disease is, you know, like for instance, it's strep throat, and from that you know what the pathogen is. But a step one question will say, which of the following is a uh, mechanism by which this pathogen causes disease? And so for instance, like a gram-negative bacteria might be lipopolysaccharide. Um, for strep pyogenes, it could be one of these. Uh, and so you'll need to know, you'll be given one of these, and then you'll be given four other virulence factors pertaining to other pathogens. And you'll need to know uh, what the virulence factor is. And there's different virulence factors for uh, and different toxins for all the different bacteria. So you need to be familiar with all these and know that these pertain to S. pyogenes. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these. First of all, S. pyogenes, it is an encapsulated bacteria. We've talked about bacteria that aren't cap encapsulated. We've talked about ones that are. Uh, so for instance, uh, viridan strep, not encapsulated. Strep pneumo. Uh, that is encapsulated. Group B strep, which we're going to talk about next, that is encapsulated. You also should know what the capsule is made out of. And the capsule of S. pyogenes is fairly unique, and it's made out of hyaluronic acid. As opposed to group B strep and strep pneumo, which we talked about, it's made of polysaccharide. Or, as we'll talk about later on, bacillus anthracis, the cause of anthrax. That capsule is made out of polypeptides. Okay, so the nice thing about capsules for us, uh, even though it helps the bacteria evade our immune system, the nice thing for ca uh, capsules for us is that we can use them and make vaccines out of them. And that's why we have a pneumococcal vaccine. That's why we have a vaccine against anthrax that we give to our military personnel. Okay, so that's, that's one cool thing about capsules. But the main purpose of capsules is to inhibit phagocytosis. Next, M-protein. M protein stands for mimicry protein. Now the purpose for the bacteria uh, to have M protein is to prevent opsonization by C3B. And you should know your complement pathway. We're not gonna talk about it here, but C3B is what uh, our immune system uses to opsonize. M protein prevents that. Now where this also comes up is that we make antibodies against virulence factors. And when we make antibodies against M protein, because that M protein or mimicry protein looks a lot like tissue in our own body, you can imagine how making antibodies against M protein is gonna cause a major problem. Um, you make antibodies against M protein, those antibodies are gonna attack our own tissue. And that is the pathogenesis of rheumatic heart disease. Why we make antibody, we have a, a, a S pyogenes infection through strep throat or whatever, uh, you make antibodies against that, those antibodies are going to attack our own tissue, and that's why we get rheumatic heart disease. Next, streptokinase. Not really important for disease processes as far as we're concerned, but I do want you to know that streptokinase catalyzes the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. A while back, we thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. We've got this chemical, this, this compound, that can convert plasminogen to plasmin, and then plasmin... Uh, plasmin uh, will break fibrin clots down uh, and, and so you can break clots. And so we decided, okay, we're gonna give streptokinase to people who have, uh, who've got things like a stroke or something like that. And in fact, when we give streptokinase to someone who's having a stroke, we can relieve the stroke. Uh, so that's where that comes into pharmacologically. Now we don't usually use streptokinase now. We've got other, uh, we've got other, uh, medications that do the same thing. The reason that we don't use streptokinase anymore is because uh, you make antibodies against it. It's immunogenic, so we try to avoid uh, giving that now. And then finally, DNA ACE. Uh, DNA ACE is something that destroys neutrophils, and you can imagine how that's going to perpetuate an infection. Again, there's a pharmacology fact here. DNA ACE uh, can be manufactured synthetically, and we call that Dornase. Now, have you ever heard of Dornase? You should. What do we use Dornase for? 
We use Dornase for patients with cystic fibrosis. And the reason we use that is that DNAase or Dornase thins out secretions. And so by thinning out secretions in pa patients with cystic fibrosis, we can help clear their airways. And so Dornase is used for that purpose. Dornase alpha in particular, it's called. Okay, next, toxins, pyrogenic toxin, also known as erythrogenic toxin. This is the big cause of toxic shock-like syndrome. Now, toxic shock-like syndrome is, as its name implies, just like toxic shock syndrome, in that this particular toxin will get in between the antigen-presenting cell and a T cell. And remember that when you have an antigen-presenting cell and it takes in an antigen and displays it on its MHC class II uh, molecule, and then that links up to a T helper cell, and when that happens, they release cytokines. And that's a good thing. You want that to happen for your immune response. What a super antigen is, and pyrogenic toxin is a super antigen, what that is is it's... It's an antigen that will come from the outside, get between MHC2 and the T-cell receptor, and link them together very tightly. And now you're going to get this flood of cytokines. And that causes toxic shock syndrome, or in this case, toxic shock-like syndrome. Now remember with Staph aureus, you get TSST1, toxic shock syndrome toxin 1. Um, with S. pyogenes, it's the pyrogenic toxin. They do the same thing. They do the same thing. Now, you may get a question on a test where you get a, uh, all the symptoms of toxic shock syndrome, they tell you, uh, but you don't want to knee-jerk and say that it's toxic shock syndrome because toxic shock-like syndrome, even though it's extremely similar, the pathogenesis is different. Not only are they caused by different bacteria, but there's one thing in the history that will tip you off to whether this is toxic shock syndrome or toxic shock-like syndrome, and we're going to get into that in a few minutes. And then finally, streptolysin O. Streptolysin O uh, is important for two reasons uh, that don't pertain to disease. First off, streptolysin O degrades cell membranes is what allows streptococci to be beta hemolytic in the first place. And then also, when we make antibodies against streptolysin O, those antibodies are called anti-streptolysin O or ASO, and those are the antibodies we look for when we do a rapid strep test. All right, let's start with the diseases now. So streptococcal pharyngitis, or strep throat, far and away the most common uh, disease that S. pyogenes causes. You see it all the time, especially this time of year, late fall, winter, even early spring, you'll see strep throat. Now, strep throat is the number one bacterial cause of pharyngitis, but the number one cause overall is viral infections. Now, how do we know if it's a viral cause or a bacterial cause? It's important to know because if it's viral, you don't treat it. Um, supportive care. If it's bacterial, if it's from strep, then uh, you have to treat it. So the symptoms are very similar between viral and, uh, and bacterial but strep. Um, you're going to get a sore throat. You're, you may have tonsillar exudates with viral, typically not, uh, but uh, you will have these tonsillar exudates with, with the strep throat. Cervical lymphadenopathy, very common, both with strep and viral, and a mild fever. So those four things. Now the way that we differentiate this from viral clinically is the, the, the best way to tell it clinically is that with strep throat, it's just in the pharynx. So you're not going to have a cough. Whereas the viral causes, which are typically adenovirus and rhinovirus, what do those viruses cause? They cause a cold, an upper respiratory tract infection. So with that, you're going to get a cough. So if you have the typical strep picture with a cough, it's probably viral. If you have the typical strep picture without a cough, it's probably strep. Either way, though, you can go ahead and get an anti-streptolysin O antibody test or a rapid strep test, and that will tell you if it's strep or not. A couple other causes of pharyngitis you'll want to have in your back pocket for the clinic and for your boards are uh, Clostridium, or sorry, Corynebacterium diphtheriae, uh, which is going to happen in an unvaccinated patient, and that's gonna, that'll come up in the vignette, that causes more severe respiratory symptoms because you can get uh, obstruction of the airway. So you want to know that one. You also want to know mono, mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus. You can get a lot of these symptoms. You get the terrible sore throat. If you've ever had mono, you know that. 
You absolutely will get lymphadenopathy and a fever. Uh, what separates mono is that you can get uh, splenomegaly, and usually the lymphadenopathy is more generalized. Now you can go ahead and get uh, ASO antibody test and get a mono spot test. With mono, the mono test will be positive. With strep, the strep test will be positive. Um, so you can differentiate it that way. But if you get a patient with the strep pharyngitis symptoms, but they have uh, generalized lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly, you know you're dealing with mono. Now I just want to put it in here because we're already on the topic and you should know this, that if you have a mono picture, but the mono spot test is negative and the strep test is negative, what is that? That's probably a mon mono spot negative mononucleosis or a, a cytomegalovirus infection, okay? So just a little bit of virology there. All right, next, scarlet fever. So scarlet fever is just strep throat along with this really weird looking uh, sandpapery rash. All this is is a very finely punctate papular rash that's so fine that when you feel it, it does in fact feel like sandpaper. And this rash will typically start on the trunk and then it'll move outward to the extremities, but it'll typically uh, spare the, uh, the palms and the soles, okay? So another thing that you'll see with this, not only the rash, but you'll see a strawberry tongue. Now a lot of students hear strawberry tongue and they think of one thing in particular. And what is that? You probably just thought about it when you heard strawberry tongue. Strawberry tongue, rash, fever. What does that sound like? It sounds like Kawasaki syndrome. And I don't want you to go into test day and see strawberry tongue and think Kawasaki because they got two separate treatments. Uh, with scarlet fever, you're gonna get an ASO antibody test, diagnose that it's strep, and treat it with antibiotics. Kawasaki's, you're gonna treat with aspirin because of the uh, the potential for uh, for vascular issues. Okay, so the two can look very similar with the rash and the fever and the strawberry tongue, but they are in fact very different, and you need to know to get an ASO antibody test. So these are the features of scarlet fever. You've got a sandpaper rash, strawberry tongue, and the circumoral pallor, which isn't really pallor, it's just that it, the, the rash, if it gets on the face, typically spares around the mouth. Uh, I noticed this when I was finding these pictures. Look at one of the authors of this picture. Name sounds familiar, A.S. Fauci, Dr. Fauci. So that's where we got that picture from. Okay, other diseases, impetigo. All you need to know about impetigo is that it, it causes these honey-crusted lesions, which are just, it's just serum that crusts over. Typically happens on the face, it's in kids, um, and usually it's outbreaks at daycares and schools. Impetigo can be caused either by strep pyogenes or staph aureus. Next, erysipelas. This is an infection of the superficial dermis. What's important here is that it's sudden and that the margins are very well demarcated. Typically erysipelas happens on the face, but it can happen anywhere. Erysipelas is almost always group A strep. Contrast that to cellulitis. Cellulitis is an infection of the deep dermis. Unlike erysipelas, it comes on very slowly and it's got very indistinct margins. So you, it's, it kind of fades as you, as you move off from the cellulitis, whereas erysipelas is very abrupt demarcation. Cellulitis can be caused by strep pyogenes, but it can also be caused by staph aureus. Next is necrotizing fasciitis. I kind of hemmed and hawed as to whether I wanted to include that on here. Strep pyogenes can cause necrotizing fasciitis. And the giveaway for necrotizing fasciitis is that you've got this sort of cellulitis looking appearance to the skin, but then you also have crepitus. And crepitus is the dead giveaway for neck fasci. Uh, usually though on the step, and this is why I didn't want to include it at first, is that on the step, if they ask you what the pathogen is for necrotizing fasciitis, it's going to be clostridium perfringens. That's the answer you're going to want to give. But in practice, usually necrotizing fasciitis is a mixed infection, possibly with strep pyogenes, possibly with uh, gram-negative rods, so gram-negative anaerobes. So, um, so I included it in, on here for completion's sake, but when you hear neck fasci, please think clostridium perfringens. And then toxic shock like syndrome. So watch the staph aureus video. I talk about toxic shock syndrome. I talk about the mechanism. What I want you to know for 
Toxic shock like syndrome is that it looks just like toxic shock syndrome, but the precursor is different. So with toxic shock syndrome from Staph aureus, the precursor is that the patient left a tampon in or they had some kind of surgery like a wisdom tooth pulled out or something like that and they had packing with like gauze and they left it in. That caused the Staph aureus infection, which then released toxic shock uh, syndrome toxin 1 and cause toxic shock syndrome, the toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock like syndrome is caused by S. pyogenes and is preceded by a skin infection. So you have cellulitis or erysipelas or something like that. You have a strep infection, it releases the super antigen and causes toxic shock like syndrome. The clinical picture though, aside from that, is absolutely identical. So this is erysipelas. Notice the well demarcated margins here, and then compare that to cellulitis. Cellulitis usually happens on the extremities. Notice how it kind of fades on the margins, and that's characteristic of cellulitis. The sequelae of group A beta hemolytic strep infections, extremely high yield, ladies and gentlemen. PSGN, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So this is the second most common cause of nephritis in children. What is the first most common cause? Most common cause of nephritis in children? IgA nephropathy. Now, this has a couple things in common with that. Both will succeed an infection, okay? So IgA nephropathy typically or will succeed an upper respiratory tract infection or like a viral gastroenteritis, and it's associated with henoxtern line purpura, which are those palpable red purpura that you see. post streptococcal nephritis will uh, succeed either strep throat or a skin infection like cellulitis. Okay, PSGN is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. What does that mean? Remember back to your immunology? means it's mediate, mediated by antibody antigen complexes. And those complexes deposit in the glomerulus they uh, elicit the complement cascade and cause inflammation and destruction of the glomerulus. Okay, so the symptoms for PSGN are what we typically see out of nephritic syndromes, cola-colored urine, facial edema. That's not because of protein wasting. That's because you're retaining sodium in water. You get facial edema. And this typically happens about two to four weeks after infection. Diagnosis, really the best way to diagnose this is just by a clinical picture and then getting positive strep titers. What I do want you to know though for clinical practice is that if you've got a, if, if you don't have a history of strep throat but you have a history of skin infection, it's really important to get the anti-DNAs. Okay, very important to get that one in addition to the ASO titers. Another thing you may see come up on uh, boards is they might ask you about the C3 level. And uh, because this is complement mediated, uh, the C3 level is going to be low because you're going to you, you're, you're be cleaving off all the C3 you've got. Uh, un under light microscopy, you'll see hypercellular glomeruli, which is typical of many nephritic syndromes. And then under electron microscopy, uh, which is much more specific to PSGN, you'll see subepithelial immune complex humps, and that's the immune complex deposition. Okay, this is not a pathology talk, so I'm not going to go into this, but this is for your own information. This is what they look like under light microscope and electron microscope. Next, the sequelae of rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever, remember, it's that M protein. You make antibodies against it, attacks your own tissue. That is the definition of a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction where you have antibodies against your own tissue. Very classic autoimmune problem. It also follows strep throat after a few weeks, and the symptoms of rheumatic fever can be remembered by the major criteria of Jones, J-O-N-E-S, but the O is a heart. J stands for joint pain, which is usually a polyarthritis or a polyarthralgia. A lot of times you won't see the inflammation, just the pain. The heart stands for carditis. It can affect any layer of the heart, but usually it's going to be an endocarditis causing a valvular lesion, usually in the left heart. Most commonly the mitral valve, but possibly the aortic valve too. It, it starts out usually with a stenosis, and then if it progresses, it will go on to a regurgitant lesion. N for nodules, subcutaneous nodules. Please don't confuse those with Osler's nodes, uh, which we see with infectious endocarditis. The nodules are subcutaneous and they are not painful. 
E for erythema marginatum, I've got a picture of that, you'll see what that looks like. S for Sydenham's chorea, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's chorea. Diagnosis with titers, uh, you can get ASO titers, but usually this is diagnosed with clinical criteria. Please do not confuse the endocarditis from rheumatic fever with the endocarditis from infectious endocarditis. Remember, infectious endocarditis uh, generally happens in patients with pre-existing valve disease who have dental work done, uh, and that's caused by, uh, by uh, the Viridans group strep. Uh, endocarditis from rheumatic fever is immune mediated. Okay, so it has nothing to do with bacteria other than you generated antibodies against bacterial component, which then went on to cause an immune reaction with your own tissue. This is how you remember the Jones criteria. It's useful here. Nice little picture that I found online. I do not have the artistic skills to make something like this. You probably know if you see anything that looks nice illustrated. I did not make it. <laughs> so my illustrations are very obvious. They're very to the point. They don't have cute little faces like this. So joints, carditis, nodules, erythema marginatum, and sydenham chorea. This is a subcutaneous nodule. If you press on it, it will not be painful. And then this is erythema marginatum. Erythema marginatum, just think of the name. Erythema on the margins. So notice how you've got the redness along the margins here, and then this big area of central clearing. The treatment for group A beta hemolytic strep infections, uh, primarily you're going to go to the beta lactams. Penicillin is possible, it's often, uh, you'll see it recommended, but, uh, and, and it is the right answer, but a lot of times uh, you may run into uh, strains that are resistant to penicillin. So in my practice, I go straight to amoxicillin clavulanate for strep throat. Um, it, it's, it's gentle, but it's also strong enough. Uh, but, you know, either or is fine. Penicillin is an acceptable answer for the boards. Uh, if they're allergic to the beta-lactams, penicillin or otherwise, uh, you can go for the macrolides. Uh, so like azithromycin, a lot of times in practice, you'll see azithromycin given out frequently for strep throat because it's five days and you're done as opposed to, you know, longer than that. Uh, and then another one that you can use is first-generation cephalosporins, like, uh, like cephalexin. And those are good because they also cover staph. So if you're dealing with cellulitis, uh, sta uh, something that covers staph would be good because cellulitis can be caused by staph, too. All right, so I put together a story for you. And uh, like I said, I'm not the most creative person, but uh, hopefully this will help you remember uh, the many features of strep pyogenes that we've talked about so far. So our story is centered around a pyromaniac, and I chose a pyromaniac because, well, pyogenes sounds like pyro, and we also have PYR positive, which is a feature that distinguishes group A strep from group B strep, as we'll learn with group B strep. Group B strep is PYR negative, but CAMP positive. And pyromaniac sounds like pyrogenic toxin, which is a toxin associated with group A strep. Remember the pyrogenic toxins, SPEA, SPEB, and SPEC. SPEA and C will cause our uh, toxic shock-like syndrome. So pyromaniac, PYR positive, pyrogenic toxins. He's carrying a gas can, which he used to help him set the fire. Gas, G-A-S, group A strep. He's got a sensitive finger because he burnt it in the fire, and that finger is sensitive to bacitracin. Remember the mnemonic, B bras, bacitracin, BR, group B resistant, AS, group A sensitive, bacitracin sensitive. Uh, we're going to give him a helmet because the helmet will help him uh, not inhale the fumes from the fire that he set. And this helmet has a yellow vi uh, visor. And yellow is going to be our symbol for acid. And that's because the capsule around strep pyogenes is a hyaluronic acid capsule. And that distinguishes it from group B strep, which also has a capsule, but that is a polysaccharide capsule. We're going to give him a tie, and that tie looks a lot like DNA, and that's because another virulence factor for strep pyogenes is DNAase. 
Okay, we're also going to give him a bow tie. That bow tie goes around his neck, which is uh, right around where you would have the strep pharyngitis infection, which is one of the diseases caused by espiogenes. While we're on the topic of strep, streptolysin O is another toxin from strep pyogenes, and that is uh, what helps strep pyogenes degrade cell membranes, including the red blood cell membrane, which allows uh, strep pyogenes to be beta hemolytic. He's going to get away on an impala, impala being impetigo, another disease caused by group A strep. And this impala has M antlers. Look at, it looks like an M. M antlers being M protein, a virulence factor of group A strep. And remember that the M protein uh, is the mimicry protein. You create antibodies to M protein and that's going to lead to rheumatic fever. Our impala has skin infections. Remember the three skin infections that can be caused by strep pyogenes, that being impetigo, cellulitis, and erysipelas. Uh, the pyromaniac is rather shocked from the fire that he caused. He didn't expect it to get this big. Shocked, toxic shock-like syndrome. Remember, that's caused by SPEA and SPEC toxins. We're going to make his jacket scarlet for scarlet fever. And the room that he set on fire, room, rheumatic fever, and it's got posts. See these posts here? For post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Rheumatic fever and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis are two sequelae that can happen within a month of a strep pyogenes infection. And while he was running away, he dropped his purple pencil, pencil for penicillins. And I made it purple because purple is for gram positive bacteria, and we use penicillins primarily for gram-positive bacteria. And while he is running away, he's being chased by a crow. Crow for macrolide. Macrolides being another antibiotic uh, class that we can give for strep pyogenes infections, namely uh, for people that are allergic to penicillins, but we can also jump right to macrolides like azithromycin, commonly given out for uh, strep pharyngitis infections. So hopefully this story helped you a little bit. We didn't cover absolutely everything about S. pyogenes, but really the helpful or the the most important stuff. So hopefully that helped you. All right, let's finish up with a question. So a nine-year-old boy presents to the clinic with his mother complaining of a sore throat for the last three days. He's otherwise in good health. Vitals are within normal limits aside from a temperature of 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Physical exam reveals tonsillar exudates and a mild cervical lymphadenopathy. The physician diagnoses the patient with an adenovirus infection and sends him home with a recommendation of symptomatic care. Three weeks later, the patient presents to the ER with dark urine and facial edema. ASO titers are positive. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this complication? A. Antibody antigen complexes. B. Antibody cross-reactivity. C. Effacement of glomerulopodocytes. D, deposition of Ig in the glomerular mesangium, or E, pyrogenic exotoxin, SPEA. All right, I will let you pause here to read this over. And now here comes the answer. A, antibody antigen complexes. All right, what did this patient have to begin with? Well, this patient had strep throat. Why do we think he had strep throat? Well, because... He had a sore throat, he had a temperature, he had tonsillar exudates, and he had lymphadenopathy, our quartet for strep throat, if you will. Now, it could have had an adenovirus infection. However, when you've got all the symptoms of strep throat, you should be getting an ASO titer, no matter what. Okay. Now, you could ask, does he have a cough? If he didn't have a cough, that puts you even more towards strep throat. If he did have a cough, then it's quite possible he had an adenovirus infection. But with all four symptoms, you should be getting ASO titers no matter what. This physician failed to do that. The patient had strep throat, was not treated, and now went on to develop what? He went on to develop post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, one of the two big sequelae of a streptococcal infection. Okay, so 
you know, not all patients with strep are going to go on to develop this, even if they're not treated. But this is the big reason why it's super important to to diagnose strep throat. It needs to be treated, not because the it, it's going to help the patient's symptoms resolve, which it will, and that's good, but because we want to prevent complications. So with the dark urine and facial edema, it really points towards post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, especially with the past history of a apparent strep infection, and then the ASO titers confirm it. So always look for, if you've got a nephritic syndrome, which is what this is, always look for the history. You know, this could have just as easily been in Petigo. All right. And I just want to bring this up. I recommend uh, to remember this. Uh, PSGN can be caused by both uh, a strep throat and a skin infection. And the way I remember that is PSGN affects the kidneys. You have two kidneys, so it can, uh, it, it can be from either. Uh, whereas rheumatic fever is only from strep throat. It, it does not come from a skin infection. The way I remember that is that rheumatic fever primarily affects the heart. You've got one heart, and so it can only come from one thing. All right, so uh, the reason that B is wrong is because that is the mechanism for rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. C, what is effacement of glomerular podocytes? What is that? That's minimal change disease. And not only is minimal change disease idiopathic and does not follow an infection, but minimal change disease will give you a nephrotic syndrome. So you would not see the dark urine, you would see frothy urine because it's full of protein. And facial edema in PSGN is not because of a loss of protein, it's because of retention of sodium and water. Now with, with uh, minimal change disease, you get a loss of albumin, and you have a generalized edema. Uh, D is uh, IgA nephritis, IgA nephropathy. And that does come after an infection, but it comes after a viral infection. So it could come after an adenovirus, an upper respiratory tract infection. It could also come after a viral gastroenteritis. Uh, but this patient has positive ASO titers, so they had strep throat. And so that's going to cause PSGN. It's not going to cause IgA nephropathy. Um, but they would look pretty similar uh, in presentation. So if ASO titers were negative and the patient had a history of a cough with all this stuff, then we would be thinking IgA nephropathy. We would also look for, and you would be given on a step one question, you'd be given a history of something that looks like Henoch-Shen line purpura, where you would have the palpable purpura and abdominal pain and stuff like that. And then E, pyrogenic exotoxin SPA, uh, that is the uh, cause of toxic shock-like syndrome, which is absolutely not uh, what's going on with this patient. Okay, so we did it all. We got through S. pyogenes, a ton of stuff, ton of stuff for step one, uh, but I tried to keep this as brief and concise as I could, um, but this is all stuff you got to know for step one. So uh, hopefully you got through this, um, and uh, uh, with that we will be moving on to group B strep next, uh, which is going to be a lot less complicated, and I'm going to try to keep that video within 15 to 20 minutes, okay? So I will see you next time. Thank you.